Namaste and welcome back to the video course on watershed management. In module number 5 on the topic of socio-economic aspects of watershed management in lecture number 20. Today we will discuss about socio-economy, private sector, participation and gender issues. Some of the important topics covered today include the socio-economical aspects of watershed management, economical assessment of watershed projects, private sector participation, role of NGOs and the gender issues. Some of the keywords for today's lecture, socio-economy, economic assessments, NGO, gender issues. So, as we discussed earlier, so when we deal with the watershed management plans, we have to see the social aspects and the economical aspects. So, both are say we have to consider an integrated way as we discussed uh, in the last lecture. So, as far as we, uh, we say the watershed management plans are concerned, it is not just a physical, the physical environment which we are dealing that means the area which we are dealing or the various resources which we are dealing, but also we have to deal with the human environment or the or, or we have to deal with the people living within the uh, watershed. So, that way we have to see their social equipment, social related issues, then the economical issues, cultural issues, all those things we have to consider when we deal with the watershed management plans. So, the social, social, cultural and economic aspects influences the typo finally that we have to adopt by the land users as well as the rate of adoption and success of adopted technologies. So, for example, when we are preparing a watershed management plan. So, that uh, the area the, there will be number of private landowners within that watershed. So, the, whatever plans we make the individuals or the individual uh, landowners should adopt the plans and then uh, they have to implement it. So, this adoption will take place if it is properly designed, if it is economically viable, if it is socially needed and if if it is say culturally also uh, the background is there. So, that way we have to see that the rate of adoption and success depends upon the, the adopted technologies what we use for the watershed management plans. So, major social, cultural and economic factors include the land tenure, capital, labor, perception, beliefs and gender. So, here you can see that land tenure. So, land tenure say as far as watershed management is concerned whether land belongs to the private owner or the public or the government or with what type of land is and that say the, the land is say for example, leased for say so many years or what kind of tenure is there. So, land tenure is uh, very important. So, it is the, the land tenure uh, is the terms and conditions on which land and other natural resources say example, trees, water. Uh, mineral resource etcetera and are held and used. So, sometimes say this the land or the various resources within the land will be leased. So, accordingly we have to see the land tenure. And then uh, so, uh, the ne next is capital. So, we, we, we need a good amount of money to start any watershed management plans. So, how much money is available, what kind of activities can be done. So, accordingly uh, we have to see. And then the next one is labor. So, labor is one of the, the important part of any watershed management plans since uh, to construct various structures or various har water harvesting plans we need labor. So, that is how we can get the labor whether locally the people will help the, the, the stakeholders themselves will help. Then perception and beliefs. So, when we are dealing with uh, the watershed management plans say for example, if you are going to uh, intensively change the la la land use pattern then we may have to deal with many things like uh, we may have to uh, change the location of some religious structures and then uh, the people have their own belief in many aspects. So, all those things we have to consider. Then gender issue means say most of the time the, the water is a main uh, subject for the women. So, they, they, they have, we have to get their feedback, their uh, opinions as far as the watershed management plans are concerned. And when we deal with the various resource management uh, say we have to deal in such a manner in which they are owned access controlled and used. So, whatever we are do, doing within the watershed uh, say it should be planned in such a way that say there should be an ownership feeling for the stakeholders or the people within the watershed and then say there should be easy accessibility should be there and then they have to the local people have to control and then they have to maintain it. So, generally when we deal with uh, the, the various issues uh, say for resource management regimes uh, we have to deal. 
say as far as the land tenure or related land issues are concerned. So, first one is private regime, second one is state property regime, third one is open access that means non uh, property regime and fourth one is common property regime. So, here uh, say you can see that when we deal with a particular watershed or particular area. So, some say uh, some of the land will be say be, 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 will be belong to the uh, the the private people or the, the private landowners. Then um, so some uh, say part will be belongs to the government, which we can call it as public land, and then some part uh, we can the all the people have access like a forest area. So like that we can uh, say uh, we can classify, and then accordingly uh, when we prepare the particular watershed management plan, uh, say we have to consider the socio-economic aspects of each regime, and then uh, we have to uh, make appropriate uh, plans. So, that way uh, we can see that uh, whenever de we deal with uh, watershed management plans, so this um, uh, most of the watershed management plans are very much capital intensive. So, um, so that way they, we have to see that uh, how much money is available, what are the sources of money available, whether how much money can be obtained from government sources or if any external funding and then uh, say uh, how the how much money can be spent by the the concerned stakeholders. So, all those issues uh, we have to deal when we discuss about the socio-economic aspects of uh, watershed management. So, unless land users have sufficient resources, they cannot engage in successful watershed management. So, if the total fund is not coming from government or other agencies, say, uh, say and if the individual landowners they do not have sufficient funds, then uh, they will not engage in watershed management plans. So, for example, labor is required for the construction of water harvesting structures. So, if you have to, if you have to construct a check dam or if you have to construct a nala bending or all that kind of structure, we need a labor, we need material. So, for all those things, uh, we need to get funding uh, from either government sources or other funding agencies or say from the landowners itself. And then uh, as we discussed, the labor is uh, very costly affair and then uh, it is most of the time beyond the reach of majority of the land users. So, uh, th therefore, resource disadvantaged land users will most likely not engage in meaningful watershed management. So, we have to see the labor issues uh, accordingly. And then uh, as we discussed in the last lecture, the, the most of the watershed management plans we have to couple with the poverty alleviation. So, poverty is usually defined as one's inability to meet their basic economic needs for clean air, water, food, shelter and uh, health care. So, that way uh, say when we link the watershed management plans with the poverty alleviation various schemes we have to plan uh, uh, with the uh, social perspectives. Uh, but of course, integrating with the economical perspectives then uh, uh, the uh, and then of course, also the ecology or environmental perspective then uh, the, the that uh, that kind of uh, watershed management plans will be acceptable to the public or acceptable to the community and then uh, they will uh, say implement it or they will cooperate in the implementation and then its uses and the uh, maintenance. So, that way uh, we have to see the various socio-economical aspects aspects as far as the uh, water uh, shed management uh, plans are concerned. Then when we discuss about the socio-economic aspects, uh, major say as far as especially in third world countries, the major watershed problems uh, which we can prescribe in, uh, in uh, say here uh, say in four terms, first one is low productivity. So, agricultural productivity is concerned, it will be uh, very low since um, say water will not be available for irrigation and then uh, say uh, people do not have so, money for buying uh, fertilizers and other things. So, that way the agriculture productivity or animal husbandry productivity will be much, much less. Uh, so, low productivity. So, when the low productivity is there, then the income will be for to the people, low income will be there and then of course, the, the, the after effect will be low savings. And then if we ask the people, kind of, say stakeholders to invest for say for example, further development plans or for the construction work, then there will not be money for investment. So, that way low inv investment. So, that way when we uh, look into all these aspects, uh, there is the environment and poverty nexus. That means, say all those things come together. So, poverty stricken people are critically uh, environment dependent. 
So, the uh, for, for the people who are do, do not have sufficient money for uh, say various activities. So, they depend the environment for various uh, things like uh, their livelihoods and then all other activities. So, like uh, people will be looking say for fish, timber, fruits, charcoal, food, medicine etcetera. So, all the poverty stricken people will be uh, looking to environment like forest or the, the river or various uh, resources available within the uh, watershed. And then uh, next aspect like labor and watershed management is concerned, labor is another vital component in watershed management. So, it is actually the most limiting constraint uh, of uh, small ho um, holder land users in the adoption and uh, sustenance of watershed management techniques. So, uh, say to construct various structures, water harvesting structures or other structures within the watershed area, uh, labor is required. So, that way and labor is uh, very expensive. Uh, so, uh, uh, that way uh, that is one of the constraint uh, which uh, say through various schemes government agencies or other NGOs or other funding agencies can help the uh, individual uh, landowners. Labor is required for establishing uh, tree nurseries, planting the trees, constructing terraces, ma manuring farms, uh, construction, constructing of check dams, etcetera, when we discuss uh, within the perspective of uh, various watershed uh, management plans. Uh, so, uh, when we uh, look into again back to the say when we review what are the problems, what are the related issues, how we can sort out this with respect to economical aspects of social issues. So, uh, we have to frame uh, methodologies for effective watershed management with a special reference to the economical aspects and the social consideration. So, for, for, for from the uh, discussion so far or the, the slides which we have seen so far, we can see that there are various issues related to social aspects or economical aspects. So, we have to see uh, this all these aspects um, uh, when we develop appropriate watershed management plans. So, the watershed management policy and legal environments uh, we have to frame appropriately. So, we have to look what are the fundamental policy and legislative weaknesses uh, associated with the contemporary watershed management programs uh, with a special focus on economic and uh, social considerations. So, when we look when we review or when we look into the, uh, the various watershed management plans uh, proposed by federal government or central government or state governments and then the, when the implementation comes, uh, we have to see what are the, the problems, say what are the weaknesses associated with uh, the present schemes, uh, so that all the uh, social aspects or the environmental aspects or the economical aspects are considered in an appropriate way. So, that way we can see that um, uh, most of the policies, existing policies uh, la lacks focus in terms of classifying projects with regard to site specific specificities and that it plays insufficient attention to monitoring and evaluation mechanisms. So, since each watershed has its own characteristics and then each um, location the people needs will be different. So, that way even if we frame a common policy or common um, uh, say watershed management policy and legal environment, it will be very difficult to deal with the individual um, uh, requirement or individual watershed basis requirements. So, we have to see whether we can uh, say decentralize this kinds of uh, say norms and uh, policies maybe to the panjayat level or to the grassroots level. So, where the issues can be say the local people can present their own problems and then uh, they can come up with um, uh, particular schemes for the uh, as far as watershed management is concerned. So, then um, uh, legislation is often uh, absent or inadequate with respect to the interdepartmental department collaboration, funding allocation, uh, sharing of resources and decentralization of authority. So, we can see that um, uh, when we look into say for example, government of India structure, say uh, agriculture ministry is there, ministry of water resources is there, ministry of environment is there. So, when we de deal with since many of these ministries or agencies are dealing with uh, water or dealing with uh, watershed related projects. So, there is we can see that um, there, is, there are no interdepartmental collaboration. So, uh, whatever proposed by Ministry of Environment there may be uh, inadequacies when we say look into the perspective of Ministry of Agriculture. So, that way the issues uh, a lot 
lot of issues are there. So, we have to integrate uh, each of the departments or the ministries or various activities and so that uh, uh, by considering the uh, economical aspects, social aspects or environmental aspects and we can frame uh, uh, say appropriate uh, policies or appropriate legal environment as far as the uh, watershed management say. So, this will be generally possible uh, say at local level than the state level or central level. So, that way we have to frame the uh, legislation and then uh, again uh, there are number of issues when we deal with um, this uh, say the watershed related issues uh, uh, say uh, within the perspective of economical issues or social issues. So, we have to uh, review the existing legislation and formulate new, legisla new legislation to address policy issues such as uh, interagency collaboration, uh, decentralization of authority and uh, sustainability of resources. So, we have to see that the resources are sustainable like uh, water, land or the, the various other resources within the watershed they are sustainable and then uh, there are appropriate collaboration between the various agencies or various departments. So, we have to frame the, the appropriate legislation uh, and then uh, this should be uh, in a decentralized way. Uh, so, that um, that will be that can be easily uh, say implemented uh, for in that in a particular watershed considered. So, uh, we have to we should have appropriate watershed management plans. Uh, so, we have to look into what are the major issues uh, associated with the uh, contemporary watershed planning methods with a special focus on economic and the social consideration at the national um, uh, state uh, or the district and watershed and uh, local levels. So, all, all at various levels we have to see the various problems and then come up with um, uh, appropriate plans as far as uh, when we deal with uh, uh, economical, social or environment issues as far as watershed management plans are concerned. And then also uh, we, ha we have to see that investment sh should be made in, uh, in information collection and national database infrastructure and easy uh, data access. So, if anybody wants to say want to study particular watershed or anybody want to prepare particular watershed management plans. So, they have to whatever data collected by various departments should be easily accessible, easily available uh, to the concerned uh, research or concerned uh, agencies. Uh, so, that um, there should be uh, say the information whatever collected should be available and then uh, it should be easily accessible, access, accessible to the uh, particular agencies or NGOs who are going to implement uh, some particular watershed management uh, uh, schemes. And then also we have to see that the schemes which we are developing is cost effective. Uh, so, cost effectiveness should be emphasized and then proper attention paid to indigenous knowledge. So, uh, we can see that when we as we already discussed say when we deal with the watershed management plans, we cannot say how part, uh, say same type of plans from one watershed to another watershed. So, in we say for particular area for particular say river basin uh, indigenous requirement will be there which is relevant to that particular area. So, indigenous knowledge also uh, say relevant to that area uh, we have to uh, look into when we discuss uh, or when we frame watershed management uh, plans. So, that way when we deal with uh, watershed management plans um, uh, uh, or the uh, when we have already implemented for the implemented watershed management plans also we have to do economic assessment. So, we have to see that whether the project is uh, economically viable and then uh, whether uh, the project will be success whatever the uh, capital investment or money spent whether that we, that uh, those, those are recoverable in various terms. So, economic assessment of watershed project is uh, very important. So, the aims of uh, most of the economic assessments are uh, whether are economic benefits uh, greater than cost. When we implement any type of project, we, we have to see that the benefits are greater than always the cost. So, whatever budget we keep for the particular project or particular uh, area. So, what will be the impact of that budget or that uh, investment? So, that we have to see. Uh, so, whether that will be the positive impacts and then after a few years the benefits will be coming up and then uh, whether that benefits will be more than what is the cost. So, that we have to see and uh, will project increase um, uh, economic stability. So, when we deal with the people of the, uh, the particular water 
watershed or the economical aspects, we have to see that um, whatever schemes we are implementing whether that will uh, um, increase the economic stability of the uh, considered people within that watershed and whether the project is attractive to private entities. So, as I mentioned when we deal with a particular watershed number of uh, private land owners will be there. So, we have to see that um, the say if we come up with certain plans which are uh, economically attractive to the private entities then only private people or private landowners then only they will implement it. And then long term work of intergeneration benefits. So, we have to see that the system is sustainable and then uh, benefits are there for not only for the present generation, for, but say um, number of generations or coming generations. And then multiple use and multi, multi products. So, whatever we are implementing uh, say uh, multiple use should be there say for example, when we are uh, implementing a check dam for a particular watershed, the water available uh, say we can use for the domestic purpose, agriculture purpose or the, the ecological purposes uh, or the, the uh, say uh, uh, there what other kinds of various uh, purposes what we can set or multiple uses are possible or not. And then we have to see the externalities uh, say what kind of um, direct uh, uh, impact and then what are the type of indirect impact uh, when we look into economical uh, assessments. Then spatial distribution of costs and benefits. So, when we are implementing particular plans we have to see that um, all the people within the watershed are getting the benefits. So, uh, we have to see that the cost also should be shared by the various landowners or various people similarly the benefits also. So, most of the time it is not so easy procedure to um, uh, quantify all those things. So, there are number of uh, difficulties in the valuation process and uh, qualification as far as the, the economical uh, assessment of the particular watershed is concerned. So, now uh, say uh, in when we discuss with the economical assessments uh, say why economical assessment is required. So, as I have already mentioned, so we have to see that the, the money which we are spending whether it is recoverable through the various benefits which are accruing with respect to that project. So, economical analysis we have to focus on net benefit to the society and its purpose is to determine whether investment is justified on economic efficiency basis. So, when we uh, identify that the benefits are more than the cost or benefit cost ratio is more than 1, we say that uh, the project is en en economically efficient. So, we have to see the economic efficiency of the particular project. And then economic analysis needed to verify that the project yields net benefit to the uh, society as a whole. So, whatever we are implementing as the, pro, the as the uh, watershed management plans, we have to see that uh, that, that will be useful uh, for the total uh, community with the of the watershed. And then economical uh, appraisal considers market traded go goods and services, but also attempts to uh, uh, value them in terms of society's true uh, willingness to pay. So, when we are implementing say for example, if through uh, construction of a dam or check dam say for a particular watershed if water is available and then uh, the cost associated whether the people are uh, ready to pay for that. So, we have to see the economic appraisals within that perspective. Then economic analysis also adds in uh, benefits cost of goods and services that are not tra traded in the uh, market uh, marketplace. So, we have to see uh, the various benefits which are not directly in terms of market uh, analysis, but indirect benefits also uh, we have to see uh, when we uh, go for economical assessment. So, then uh, now let us see the, for what are the, the way we have to consider an economic appraisal. So, in this slide uh, you can see the uh, various um, things to be considered economical appraisal are listed. So, economical appraisal should include uh, following basic steps. So, the questions like what is the project trying to achieve towards uh, what objectives is it aimed. So, what are the objectives uh, for, for that particular project. Then what problems is it trying to overcome? Say is it uh, trying to overcome the water availability problems or the land degradation problem or sedimentation issues. So, that way we have to see. Then main alternatives for uh, achieving the objectives say for each uh, problems there will be number of alternatives. So, we have to see the important alternatives and then we have to do a um, cost benefit analysis and then we have to see the maximum beneficial schemes. So, main alternatives for achieving the objectives we have to see and then 
uh, we have to see its costs and benefits. Then alternatives for achieving the objectives, so uh, say what are the alternatives available. So, like definition and quantification of the physical inputs uh, uh, and outputs involved for the particular project. Then developments of tables which show inputs and outputs over the time. Uh, so, we can construct make tables for say what will be the input for particular project and what will be the output coming from uh, by implementation of that project. So, that way we can uh, have tables and then we can compare. Then uh, determination of unit values uh, say for uh, both the market and economic for uh, inputs and outputs over time say say per ton uh, uh, say uh, uh, agricultural products what will be the, co uh, the price available or to produce say per ton per hectare uh, say what will be the cost involved. So, like that we have to see uh, both the market on market terms and economic terms and then development of uh, value flow tables showing total values of benefits and costs estimated to occur over life of the project. So, uh, when we deal with watershed management plans, so the plan what we are implementing for a particular watershed that may be for 50 years, 100 years like that. So, we have to see for that uh, the, the total uh, years say how the benefits are uh, uh, coming over, over the life of the project say whether it is increasing or decreasing and then uh, say cumulative effect what will be there. So, all those things uh, we have to uh, economically analyze uh, with respect to the particular watershed management plans. So, we, we need to have an effective economic appraisal for the particular watershed uh, project. So, now let us look into what are the important factors and limits of uh, economic assessment. So, uh, when we deal with the economic assessment of watershed projects, so the project uh, uh, is worth uh, say what is the worth of the project. So, like um, what is the project feasibility and attractions. So, we have to see that um, the project is attractive to the people and what are the feasibility of that particular implementation of the project. Then uh, what are the risk factors, once it is implemented what will be the problems, what are the environmental problems, uh, whether um, how much land will be flooded say if we construct a particular check dam or um, whether um, uh, the, the, the soil erosion problems will be more when we particular when we go for particular farming or that kind of things. Then uh, project design and various alternatives, so we have to see within terms of the project work what are the various alternatives and then its design and then uh, uh, what are the uh, costs and benefits and then what are the limitations uh, with respect to the, the uh, economic assessment for particular watershed projects. Say we cannot uh, uh, say quantify all benefits, uh, say there are number of uh, direct benefits and number of indirect benefits will be also there. So, all those things we cannot quantify. So, those are some of the limitation, limitations as far as the, the economic assessment is concerned. And then also uh, say what kind of assessment we can do uh, that depends upon uh, what kind of data is available. So, we need a, a huge amount of data when we deal with the economic assessments since we have to see the, the cost uh, with respect to various implementations and then what are the benefits like direct benefits, indirect benefits, future benefits like that. So, some of the major techniques used for um, uh, economic assessments are listed here. So, um, we can see that uh, if that project uh, is not there then what will be the problems and when once we implement the project what will be the economical uh, improvement or economical um, uh, say benefits. So, that way with and without project approach we can study. Uh, uh, so, that is one of the major technique used uh, say when we deal with economical uh, economic assessments. Then uh, we can see say next one is discount uh, say how much discount say for the particular uh, capital investment is done then uh, say, uh, say, say for the coming years what kind of discount we have to put. So, discount rates we can calculate or future values we can find. Then uh, the last one is cost and benefit analysis. So, as I mentioned say for particular projects which we are going to implement for a say for a watershed what will be the cost and then what will be the immediate benefits or future benefits. So, we can do an extensive cost and benefits analysis. 
So, then uh, uh, say we can see that um, say in all these cases we have to collect all the data what our particular say particular methodology is required and then we have to analyze it this data and then come up with um, uh, say, say particular methodology can be used like uh, if the project is there or if the project is not implemented what will happen or we can identify what will be the discount rate which we have to keep for the particular investments or we can calculate the uh, benefit uh, cost ratio uh, with respect to the, the implementation of that project. So, now let us uh, discuss in detail about some of these uh, techniques which are used for economic assessments. So, we can calculate the net present value or net present worth for that particular investment. So, in the case of uh, this uh, net present worth, we are trying to determine present value of net benefits of a project. Uh, so, uh, this uh, net present worth is equal to present value of all benefits uh, minus present value of cost. So, that will be the uh, net present worth for that particular project. So, we can identify uh, what will be the, uh, the uh, uh, present value of cost say the this year, next year or coming years what we have to spend for that particular pro project. So, we can identify what will be the uh, present value of those costs uh, and then uh, say the benefits are concerned what will be the immediate benefit and then future benefits. So, for say uh, for 10 years or 20 years whatever the period uh, expected life period of that project. So, we can identify what the present value of all benefits. So, uh, we say that project is acceptable if uh, this net uh, percent worth is uh, say 0 or positive. So, when uh, benefits minus cost is uh, greater than or equal to 0, the project is acceptable. So, this uh, net percent worth we can calculate using this formula given here. So, where net percent worth is equal to sigma uh, t is equal to 1 to n uh, b t minus c t divided by 1 plus r uh, to the power t, uh, where b t is the benefit, uh, c t is the cost in year t, uh, uh, b t is the benefit in year t, t uh, r is the discount rate and n is the number of years which we consider for that. Uh, particular project. So, that way uh, we can calculate the net present uh, worth of the project and then uh, say for various alternatives uh, say what we propose for that particular project or particular watershed. We can calculate this NPW uh, net present worth and then identify which will give more benefits. Uh, so, accordingly uh, we can choose that alternative uh, say. Uh, so, we to compare several alternatives uh, we can uh, say calculate this net present uh, worth uh, and then we can make a table and then we can rank it. So, accordingly the decision maker can choose particular uh, project or particular uh, scheme which will give uh, maximum uh, net present worth. So, this net present worth is one of the technique used in the economic assessment of uh, watershed uh, management plans or watershed projects. So, then uh, 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 next one uh, next methodology as far as economic assessment is concerned it is uh, so called the benefit cost ratio. So, the ratio it is the ratio of present value of benefits to present value of cost. So, that can be calculated by using this equation uh, b by c is equal to sigma t is equal to 1 to n uh, b, b, b t divided by 1 plus r to the power t divided by sigma t is equal to 1 to n c t divided by 1 plus r to the power t where b t is the benefit uh, uh, in that particular year, c t is the cost in that year, uh, then r is the discount rate which we have to uh, assign and uh, n is the number of years uh, which we consider. So, as I mentioned already, uh, we will say that a particular uh, alternative or particular scheme uh, for a project or a for a watershed project, uh, we say that it is economically feasible when the uh, benefit cost ratio is more than 1 uh, as given here. So, if we plot the benefits on the x axis and the costs on the y axis, so we can say that the point of effectiveness is when this, uh, the, this particular point where the, uh, at least the, the benefits is equal to the cost or benefits exceeds uh, the cost. So, that we can say that the particular project is um, uh, economically uh, beneficial uh, or it is a, a project is acceptable uh, say by considering this benefit cost ratio. 
Then another methodology which is commonly used is called uh, economic rate of return or ERR. So, here uh, we calculate the, the discount rates by uh, using an equation. So, here the discount rate that sets present value of all benefits equal to the present value of total benefits. So, otherwise uh, we can identify this economic rate of return uh, um, say R such that uh, uh, say uh, the computed ERR is compared with some reference discount rate to know whether project is economically feasible. So, we can identify this um, rate of uh, return uh, or discount rate by using this equation sigma t is equal to 1 to n uh, b t minus c t divided by 1 plus r to the power t uh, where b t is the benefits uh, for the particular year c t is the cost and r is the discount rate and t is the number of years. So, by solving this equation if you the, uh, the benefits and costs are known and the number of years are known. So, then we can identify what will be the, the discount rate. So, when this uh, say the whatever the discount rate uh, uh, which we are getting we can compare with some reference discount rate. So, if uh, whatever we are getting is uh, say uh, if computed uh, say uh, economic rate of return is greater than the project fund cost so correspondingly what to the reference cost. So, and then the project is uh, economically attractive. So, that way uh, we can identify what will be the discount rates uh, say with respect to that particular uh, project investments and then from that uh, we can identify whether the project is economically viable or economically uh, attractive. Also, when we deal with the economic assessments, we can uh, carry out a sensitivity of various parameters like sensitivity analysis and then we can do a total financial analysis. Uh, so, all those things uh, we can consider uh, within the perspective of economic assessments. So, economic assessment procedure uh, say we can list various steps like uh, here what is given here. So, we can develop technical relationships and quantifying physical inputs and outputs. Then uh, find uh, monetary values and developing uh, value flow uh, tables as I already mentioned say value related to labor, equipment and materials or initial investment etcetera. Then uh, measuring the project worth what is the worth of the project so that we can identify. Then we can carry out uh, sensitivity of various parameters say for example, discount rates, uh, benefit value estimate cost assumptions etcetera. So, that will also indicate how what is economical uh, viability of that particular project. So, uh, we, especially when we deal with the uh, watershed management economical assessments, so uh, the uh, say the agencies uh, say like NGOs or other um, external agencies have to give appropriate uh, assess, uh, assistance uh, say for the assessments. So, like for establishing the technical relationships, so since the most of the time uh, the particular stakeholders or particular people may not be knowing uh, all these issues. So, uh, we have to give assistance in the economical assessments uh, say uh, for establishing technical relationship, identifying the cost and identifying the uh, benefits. So, this is uh, required as in, in, in most of the uh, watershed areas. So, uh, now what we discussed is the socio-economical aspects of watershed management plans or watershed management development programs and then how to assess economically assess the watershed development projects or various alternatives uh, by using various schemes and then uh, come up with an uh, economically viable project or uh, wherever the benefit uh, is more than the cost or benefit uh, cost ratio is more than 1 that particular scenario or particular uh, alternative we can choose as far as the implementation is concerned. So, now uh, as we discussed in the last lecture say uh, to implement particular watershed management plans, uh, we need uh, uh, the, uh, the various departments of the government, then the, uh, the stakeholders, uh, then the community participation uh, etcetera as we discussed. So, uh, with, within with this with the, uh, say the, the participation from various agencies, we can see that now uh, private sector has a major role to play uh, as far as the various uh, watershed management uh, plans preparation, implementation and maintenance. So, private sector is uh, very important. So, private sector participation is actually some one way or another way people participation 
discussion only. So, uh, that means, uh, say the stakeholders within that watershed or say outside agencies like non government organizations NGOs. So, uh, we can uh, the NGOs are now uh, say uh, have a major role in many of the watershed development schemes. So, say we, we, when we discuss the people participation, we have to see that um, uh, say the participation can be at the development stage like a pre project stage or planning stage or implementation stage uh, and then it can be for maintenance, evaluation etcetera. So, the people participation or this private participation also can be uh, in any of this. And then private sector like our NGOs uh, say we can use effectively the NGOs uh, say in the watershed management plans as demonstrated in many many case studies uh, in India and uh, other countries. So, the NGOs can motivate people to participate in all the stages like um, uh, pre project planning or implementation or maintenance and evaluation stages. And uh, the, the NGOs can make them understand the knowledge uh, inputs required by people. So, NGOs can uh, from the beginning itself pre project itself they can uh, go to the people and then they can demonstrate they can uh, try to understand the people uh, make understand the people the, the inputs required and then how they can uh, do this particular watershed management plans. Then NGOs can organize uh, education programs prior to program initiation. So, that way NGOs can play a major role in many of the uh, watershed management plans. So, uh, say uh, when we discuss the NGOs or private sector participation, so we can uh, use this organization in various way, uh, say it can be as in small informal groups or traditional community associations or cooperatives and trade unions and to reach all sectors of the uh, rural population concerned. So, we can have various types of organizations as far as the um, private sector participation is concerned. And then uh, uh, say uh, this um, uh, private sector partic participation that we can use to encourage governments to adopt methods to help the these various organizations like NGOs to become self sufficient or the cooperatives like um, the Amul cooperatives or these cooperatives are formed um, with the support of the government and then now uh, say now it has become uh, so big that um, uh, they can control the milk production in at various uh, states uh, like that. So, that is the advantage of say like um, private sector participation or cooperation cooperatives and trade union. So, then to change administrative and budgetary procedures to um, uh, facilitate uh, hand over to the uh, local level of powers and tasks involved in decision making, tax collecting uh, and expenditure. So, once the project level implementation comes and then executions and uh, say maintenance is concerned, NGOs can uh, play or private sector can play, play a major role. And also to set up local planning consultation bodies which will comprise representatives of the, uh, the people organizations, NGOs and other um, authorities uh, have to help in decentralizing uh, decision making. So, that way uh, the private sector participations or NGOs can play a major role in many of the uh, watershed ma management schemes or uh, plans. So, uh, when we discuss about the role of NGOs in watershed developments, so the success of watershed developments uh, depends on working out collective protocols of equitable and uh, sustainable use of surface water and ground water. So, as far as water is concerned, uh, we have to develop protocols for equitable distribution, equitable su su sustainable use uh, as far as surface water and ground water are concerned. Then bringing together uh, scientists, um, uh, economists uh, and farmers uh, in all this, so that way NGOs can uh, help. Then involvement of community and private sectors. So, like you private landowners, uh, they can uh, say NGOs can bring all this together. So, all of NGOs in watershed development is very important. So, it can be either pre project or uh, planning stage or implementation maintenance stage, uh, all stages NGOs can play a major role. So, it can be for creation of awareness, social mobilization, capacity building and training as we have seen in many of the case studies uh, which we discussed in the uh, previous uh, lectures. So, that way NGOs have a major role to play in watershed management um, uh, say in all stages. So, NGOs um, uh, uh, roles uh, can be used to improve the effectiveness of project delivery 
to empower village communities to take control of the projects uh, like processes and outcomes, then to improve the levels of transparency and participation of communities, to facilitate the learning process of different partners at different levels based on uh, objective assessment of field experience. Then uh, NGOs can uh, join uh, the government sector or international agencies, uh, so that um, uh, say they can play a major role in getting the funds from the government or from various international agencies and then utilization of that fund for particular uh, say watershed management plans or in particular areas. So, uh, there are various agencies uh, say who funds for watershed related projects like uh, United Environmental Program, Food and Agriculture Organization, IFAD, World Bank, USAID, uh, CARE, Oxfam, SIDA, ICRISAT, etc. So, uh, so, we can see that if you look into uh, various third world countries like uh, India and uh, other countries, we can see that um, number of NGOs are working in this area, they are doing a very positive role, they are doing very actively involved in the watershed management plans. Uh, say they are bringing funds from various agencies uh, in watershed development projects and then uh, uh, they are getting involved with the people in the, in the planning stage to implementation and maintenance of that particular project in particular area. So, that way there is a big role to play uh, by NGOs in the uh, watershed management plans. So, if you look into the history of the watershed management developments in India, from 1980s the role of NGOs became increasingly important in the development sector in India. So, last uh, 30, uh, 40 years we can see that um, a number of NGOs are working in this area. So, so, NGOs have ability to bridge as demonstrated, NGOs have the ability to bridge gap between people's needs and available uh, resources and services. Then several projects implemented by NGOs have demonstrated their ability for new approaches and techniques uh, for mobilizing uh, local economics. So, what we can see that um, uh, in many locations, like many agencies like ICRISAT, then Grameen Vigas, um, uh, Panjayat, so like that various uh, NGOs have played a major role uh, in, the, in the watershed development plans, watershed management plans. So, as a partner in the commonly shared visions, NGOs have adopted a new role in uh, operationalizing the implementation of regional watershed management policies uh, at the local level. So, if the central government or state governments or um, say various authorities make plans, so NGOs can uh, play a major role in, uh, in, the, in uh, uh, modifying those plans and then also uh, uh, say uh, implementing uh, the, these type of plans at local level. So, the NGOs role are essential uh, in local coordination and education. Uh, uh, then um, also uh, the, this makes NGOs the nuclei of for a successful watershed management uh, plans. So, as we if we uh, critically analyze various watershed management plans going at various locations in India or other, other countries, we can see that NGOs are playing a major role, they are the nuclei of uh, successful uh, watershed management uh, plans. So, that what we are discussing is about the private sector participation and the role of NGOs uh, in the watershed development uh, plans and watershed management uh, plans. So, now uh, another issue what I want to discuss here is gender issues. So, uh, say uh, most of the uh, watershed management plans now we can see that last few decades the role of women have become uh, very active. Uh, so, gender sensitive approach is uh, very much essential in watershed management plans. So, watershed management initiative that exclude women as stakeholders ignore half the population, decreasing the efficiency and effectiveness of uh, actions promoted. Use of a gender uh, approach in dealing with the social environmental dynamics of watershed can open avenues and opportunities for achieving equity between women and men by considering their unique interests, uh, demands and expe expectations. A gender, a gender sensitive approach to watershed management uh, emphasizes affirmative actions to address human disadvantages positions and conditions in many societies. So, we can see that um, uh, women are the 
say the, the, the women are taking say especially for household purposes they are bringing water they are very much actively involved in in farming and all other activities so that way we have to consider the role of women in the watershed um, management plans so uh, the women constitute more than 50% of the world population women play a pivotal role in agriculture development and the management of natural resources as i already mentioned so their involvement is indispensable for the effective implementation and equitable distribution of the benefits of watershed management so uh, we should get their opinion they are uh, uh, in the planning stage itself and then uh, they should be also get, get involved in the various execution and implementation and maintenance so managers of community natural resources and how they have learned to protect these resources in order to preserve them for future generations so uh, we have say when women are uh, uh, say they are in these schemes we can see that most of the projects become more sustainable so they have extensive knowledge experience and common sense in use and uh, management of uh, natural resources like water land uh, and then uh, various uh, issues are concerned then uh, women often oversee um, say they, they are looking after water food fuel and uh, fodder requirements of the family and cattle so that way uh, it is always essential we have to take care uh, their viewpoints so women also use um, natural resources for economic activities uh, building and uh, repair work crops and food processing so that way uh, we can uh, see that um, women role is very important in watershed development plans so it is clear that poverty alleviation can be ensured through a watershed development program only when women have a stake in decision making so that their basic needs are met and uh, uh, they can have better control um, uh, say in the watershed uh, development projects uh, its maintenance and its, it, its sustainability. So, most of the watershed projects whatever which were successful if we critically analyze we can see that when women have participated considerably uh, and then uh, their opinions were taken in, uh, taken care and then uh, they were there in the implementation and the maintenance then most of these projects are uh, very much successful. So, that way uh, we can see that uh, women participation is very important in the uh, water development projects. So, now before closing let us uh, go through a case study. Uh, so, this is the equity in community based sustainable development a case study in western India. The case study area is uh, Hibre Basar in Nagpur, uh, Nagar Taluk in Ahmadnagar district in Maharashtra, India. So, the, the watershed area is about 9.77 square kilometer. Uh, main occupation of the people in this area is agriculture. So, out of this uh, uh, 977 hectares, so 795 hectares is cultivable. The average annual rainfall in the area is only uh, 579 millimeters. So, that way this, was, this is a semi arid region and this uh, whatever available uh, rainfall is uh, through erratic way and uneven distribution. So, the principal form of irrigation in the village is uh, well irrigation, open wells people are which are dug, dug well. So, the population in 2001 is was about 1150. So, uh, here as far as land distribution is concerned 27 percent are marginal land holders, 39 percent medium or small land holding and uh, um, about one third people are landless in this uh, watershed area. So, the details are taken from th this paper by uh, Priya which is published in uh, Economic and Political Weekly in 2006. There some what are the problems of this watershed some of the important problems I have listed here. So, in the 1970s this particular watershed was uh, say, uh, say the, the economical activities or the agriculture activity was very very low. Uh, so, as I mentioned it was a semi arid area uh, water for irrigation was scarce and women had to walk long distance to fetch bringing water. So, this uh, resulted in low agriculture productivity and most uh, one Kharif crop typically Bajara could be managed and sometimes Jowar in the Rabi season. Uh, so, mainly only one crop were used to be there before these watershed projects uh, were implemented. Uh, so, people used to go out uh, say uh, for job since there were no sufficient employment opportunities within the area. So, the villages uh, were under the influence of alcohol addiction and gambling which resulted in frequent fights and the village became notorious uh, in the region uh, in the 1970s. So, in 1980s a group of youngsters under the leadership of 
Popat Rao Pawar uh, came together and they formed an NGO called uh, Yashwanth uh, uh, Agricultural uh, and Rural and Watershed Development Agency. This was set up in 1993 and a scheme uh, began to be implemented from 1994. So, the watershed development was derived from the community initiative uh, in watershed developments. Uh, so, they have they put a role model of relevance the, in the implementation of this project. So, uh, they, they were keeping five important principles as far as the watershed development intervention is concerned. Uh, restriction on free grazing, free grazing was not allowed, ban on uh, tree felling, so uh, tree felling uh, was totally banned, ban on alcohol, uh, adoption, family planning and then voluntary labor uh, for the implementation of various projects. So, these were the unique um, uh, features of this uh, particular uh, watershed implementation or watershed projects. Uh, uh, village was divided into three micro watershed, the first uh, with um, about 612 hectares, second with about 123 hectares and third with uh, 241 hectares. And then uh, various interventions uh, were done, uh, the principal watershed work constructed include continuous contour trenching, tree plantation, uh, then uh, contour bending, nala bending like uh, five uh, important nala bending has been done, then two uh, percolation tanks and five story bandaras were constructed in this particular watershed. Uh, so, this work were all done in a span of about four years um, uh, by this uh, NGO under the leadership of Popo Rao. So, then uh, when this what are the effects of this when we when the when do it was studied the impacts were analyzed at the beginning of 2000. Um, uh, so, uh, there was a huge change what has uh, taken place within this watershed. So, we can see that uh, the water availability and water potential has uh, increased drastically. And so, especially uh, say uh, milch animals like cows and buffaloes uh, people started uh, owning and um, uh, the milk production has increased more than tenfold in the area and now village has uh, its own dairy cooperative. So, this particular village, so that where the um, important impacts. Then uh, there was increase in the level of water in the wells uh, and that led to uh, more lands becoming irrigated uh, within the area with the results that both intensity and uh, pattern of cropping have changed resulting in higher incomes. So, instead of one crop people have started two crops and as sufficient water were available to the people. Uh, so, uh, that way uh, uh, then there were lot of employment increased demand for labor and which laborers no longer have to go outside uh, other places in search of work. So, reverse migration started uh, say with all these initiatives. So, both the quality of the technical watershed works and the resulting positive so, socio economic changes have now been uh, widely acknowledged um, uh, all over the world in this particular uh, say particular role model uh, like religions in the so this particular uh, watershed area. So, some of the important sh lessons learned based upon the uh, this studies um, uh, Hirve Basar experience stands out not only in terms of its equity outcome, but also in terms of improvement in livelihoods and, it, uh, and the impact on the sustainability. A measure to uh, attenuate the negative impact of the ban on grazing the uh, rules about use of water and the careful targeting of watershed uh, plus measures have been uh, particularly critical uh, in this particular watershed. So, some of the inequities uh, considered inherent to watershed development projects can be partially uh, remediated uh, by local uh, level initiative as demonstrated in this area. So, uh, local problems were sorted out uh, locally itself when the people came together as an NGO and then when the projects uh, were implemented. So, that way we can see the success of this particular project by considering the social impact, social effects, uh, economical aspects and the environmental aspects. So, these are some of the important references used for today's lecture. Finally, say a few questions, tutorial questions, why we need a economic assessment of watershed projects, explain major techniques of economic assessments, uh, how we can effectively assess the economic impacts of watershed projects, uh, from the literature critically study the economical impacts of watershed development projects. Then a uh, few self evaluation questions, uh, what is the importance of socio-economic analysis of watershed management projects? How to do socio-economic assessment for watershed projects? Discuss the role of private sector in watershed development projects. 
why gender issues uh, important in watershed management projects and what are the important socio-economic uh, components of uh, watershed development projects, what are the important techniques used for economic assessment of watershed uh, projects, describe the role of NGOs in watershed management projects, discuss women role in watershed development projects. So, all these questions you can answer by going through today's lecture. So, finally, one unsolved problem. So, for your watershed area critically study the various implemented and uh, proposed watershed development management plans using benefit cost ratio method carry out any economical assessment of the implemented and proposed watershed management plans, critically evaluate various watershed management plans like water harvesting measures or irrigation projects or belt irrigation, canal irrigation etcetera and economically compare each schemes in terms of uh, benefit cost ratio. So, this also you can try to do uh, by going through uh, today's lecture. So, today what we discussed was the uh, social aspects, economical aspects, then uh, gender issues and role of NGOs in watershed development uh, plans. So, now uh, say further we will uh, say discuss the integrated development and uh, water legislation and policies as far as watershed management plans uh, in the next lecture. Thank you very much.